Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome everybody once again to the House of the Unusual podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pavlansky, and with me, as always, is the maestro of mail order mysteries and owner of House of the Unusual, Eddie Guevara. Eddie, what's going on, brother? Brother, everything's going as planned, man. Uh, same thing I say every week. Everything's going as planned. Um, you know, with all the changes and everything approaching uh, the season now, we're getting close to the summer. But what comes after summer? Halloween. October, the month of October, when Chiller Theater comes back again and uh, Monster Bash will be making its uh, big time debut indoors. Uh, I'm looking forward for it, my friend. I'm actually looking to hold the table this year at Chiller Theater. Oh, um, nice. So I, I guess that will be really, uh, I mean, you're a couple hours away, so I'm not sure if you're going to be attending Chiller Theater, Joe. I might, I might have to try. I've always wanted to, to head out there and, and check it out, but I mean, it's probably about five, six hours for me, so I would definitely have to uh, try to uh, get some things all in line to get out there. Well, uh, you know what? It's always it's a couple of months away, my friend. You should make it a plan, and I'll be there at my table with me, my friend. This way we could tell the people about the podcast. We might even do a live podcast right from the show. Yeah, that would definitely be be really cool. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to plan up on that. So w- what's going on with the? Uh, you got some magic items going to be coming out. In about another two weeks is the completion. I'm waiting on the production of the boxes for the all new magic trick from Chuck Caputo called the Gathering. It's a phenomenal trick. People are going to like it. It's going to be available, um, and there's a surprising guest on the cover, but we won't say who it is for now. Uh, so, people will have to yeah. wait and see. But Joe, uh, what, sounds good, what, man. What interesting topics do you have today, man? Well, you know, I'm I'm fresh off of uh, we had Monster Bash under the stars this past week, and so I'm I'm fresh off of that, and you know, all hyped up. We seen they they had some good movies. Uh, you know, it was real cool during the day. They had the vendors out and. And then four o'clock, there was a uh, each day Friday and Saturday they did a uh, cornhole tournament where you had ten tosses, and each board had just one hole in it. So if you got one on the board, it was one point, and if you got one in the hole, it was two points. And on your tenth throw, if you got it in the hole, you got an extra throw, and if you made that one in the hole, you got another one, and so on. So each day I came in third place. First place was a hundred dollar gift certificate. Second place was like a, a grab bag of goodies. And I came in third place each day. So I was kind of I was kind of bummed about that. But it was uh it was good weather, man. And I tell you what, they had some um all the people there at the it was at uh, in Vandergriff PA at the drive in there and everybody was was just awesome. They're all the uh, Monster Bash workers, all the the Vandergrift drive-in workers. They were just you know top-notch people. And uh, as soon as the sun went down on on each day, about nine o'clock, they started playing uh, the movies. Which each movie started off with the first movie always started off with a cartoon, you know, a classic Looney Tunes or something like that, and then a uh, a short either Stooges, Our Gang. Uh, I think that was, yeah, it was either Stooges or our gang that were the, the shorts and then would play the, the movie. So Friday night we had a, a nice lineup of, I married a monster from outer space, 1958, which that was my first viewing of that movie. And I tell you what, if nobody out there has ever seen it, check that movie out. It is, it is excellent. It really plays up on the, um, the cold war hysteria that went on, you know, during the, the uh the 1950s um then right after that they play the original war of the worlds from 1953 which i haven't seen that for years so it was nice to brush up on that movie and i I forgot just how spectacular uh the special effects and everything was in in that so 
that was definitely cool. And then another movie that played, the final movie that played after that is one that I, I've never seen. It was The Curse of Frankenstein, 1957, with um, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. It was a hammer horror, their version of Frankenstein. And it was um, it was different. It was it was a decent movie. It's something I definitely would like to revisit again and and check it out a little bit more in depth. But that was um, my first viewing of that as well. And then Saturday night, I was kind of excited about th- Saturday night because there was two movies playing also that I've I've never seen. But the first movie I've seen many times, which was Revenge of the Creature, nineteen fifty five, and um, it, it's probably not the best one of the the creature movies, but it was it's you know it's a universal monster movie so it was that was cool to see uh and following that was the one that i was really excited about to see because i had i've always wanted to watch it and and for some reason i've never seen it and um i i'd never got the dvd for one reason or another but it was uh this island earth from 1955 and i'd always heard that it started off slow and then the end kind of picked up but i I tell you what it was a it was a good movie from beginning to end. I, um, it, it did have some of its plot issues and all that, but the for 1955, the special effects and all that were amazing. And the uh, Meta Luna monster at the end is is just a iconic monster. So if nobody's ever seen that before, <laughs> this island Earth definitely definitely watch it because it, it is well worth seeing. And then. The final movie, another one that I've always wanted to see because it is a, a straight-up horror movie, and it's The Thing That Couldn't Die from 1959. And it is a uh, it is a spooky little tale. It's a very short movie. I think it's just a little over an hour. But it is uh, it, it definitely hits the mark. It, it's a it's a spooky tale. So it was it was a really cool, uh, really cool event. Some definitely some good movies. And, and I think the, really the highlight of that weekend was they announced that this October, there's going to be a indoor monster bash, um, at the double tree hotel on Mars PA from October 22nd to 24th. Uh, so all the restrictions in PA have been lifted. It's a, it's a full go monster bash. So definitely, you know, if you're interested in going to that out there, check out monsterbashnews.com, and they they have all how you could get a hold of the hotel. Uh, there's a special rate for Monster Bash attendees there, and then they'll be updating the schedule soon. So definitely excited about that, and and can't wait to hit that up uh, and see some of my uh, my Monster Bash friends there. And it was nice to see some of them there at this. Um, at the drive-in because last year, you know, with everything shut down, I, you know, I missed out on a lot of my buddies that I, I usually see at the, the conference, most of them right for scary monsters, but it was, uh, it was nice to see them again and to catch up and to kind of bullshit on some upcoming uh, projects and some past projects, which brings me to our topic for tonight, because I was talking to, um, to a guy that writes for, for scary monsters, uh, and he had brought up the subject of the of space patrol and the Ralston rocket. He said he really enjoyed the the article that I did uh, a few issues back for uh, for scary monsters. I can't remember what issue it was, but I think it was maybe two or three behind. But uh, it kind of made me want to talk about the the you know some prizes that were given away in contests. You know how you know, we look at now the, the prizes and it's nothing compared to, to what the Ralston rocket was. And you had never heard of this before. Is that, that correct? Uh, you know what, Joe, it's not that I didn't hear about it. I didn't remember it, but then I, you know, as, as when you told me the last time I did some and I realized I had seen it prior, uh, but a long time ago, uh, Joe. Okay. So for people out there that aren't familiar with it, we'll, we'll kind of start at the beginning and, uh, We'll go through it. I mean, because there's a ton of information with it, and it's it's definitely a, a part of history that um, that shouldn't be forgotten, especially for for people like us and for the people out there in podcast land who uh, who are interested in this stuff. So we'll start off with 
you know, you've watched Space Patrol, I, I take it, right? Because I know you're real big into science fiction. I, I did a long, long time ago. <laughs> Don't you hear that? The echo. Oh, what are you in a cave? <laughs> Apparently, that's the Space Patrol. Yeah, really? The Space Patrol coming on. <laughs> Yeah, so for those of you out there that have never heard of Space Patrol, it was a TV program that uh, aired from 1950 to 1955. So it ran about five and a half seasons. They had 210 30-minute TV episodes and 915-minute episodes. And they also did uh, 129 radio uh, episodes as well. And... I, I good luck finding a lot of these these TV episodes because a lot of them uh, they're really tough to find. There's no box sets or anything out there that I've been able to come across. There's a few DVDs that have anywhere from two to four episodes on them. Um, but there's only a few of those. If you download some some of the, like the old classic TV apps from uh, that might be on Roku or something, uh, sometimes you'll find a a space patrol episode or two, but they're, they're really cool. And during the 1950s, when it showed, it was the, I mean, it was the, the biggest thing out there. Everybody, every kid, th th that's what they wanted was, was stuff from, from space patrol. And I believe it was the, um, they had, I think it was one year they had over like 40 million in sales on um, just over 80 different mass produced items. So that would have been in today's dollars about $379 million. So that was a, a lot at the time, you know, selling these kids toys, which were, you know, helmets or blaster rays or costumes or, or whatnot. So yeah, it was it was, a, what's that? It was very uh, popular, and one of the things I, I don't know if you're aware of was in comic books there was also a space patrol helmet that it was uh, really nice, and it was sold by you know mail order. Um, I believe, believe it or not, I ha I might have one in my collection that I got many many years ago. Uh, it's um, it's kind of like very clear, very flimsy. It's not that great, but um, I think it was based on space patrol. Uh, yeah, they, they did have a nice helmet that they they sold. I, I I seen one on eBay a while back, but it was pretty beat up, and they wanted a, a hefty price for it. But I'm gonna wait to find a uh, a better one at a, at a decent price. I I got mine very decent. I mean, I got it many many years, probably in the early '90s. You know what I was gonna tell you, Joe? Uh, it's kind of funny that you mentioned right before we started talking about the Rolston rocket. Uh, the movie that you mentioned, This Island Earth. And another one that's called Earth versus the Flying Saucer. Those films are phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm not sure exactly which one was the one that Alan Russell, the guy that played the professor in Gelligan's Island, appeared in. Was it This Island Earth or I kind of I think it was This Island Earth. Was he on that when you saw it? Uh, you know what? I can't remember. I want to say it was This Island Earth, if yes, I'm not mistaken. I'm, if I'm correct as well, you also had the guy Charles Heston. Not Charles Heston, uh, Charles Bronson uh, was in one of those two either, also as well. Uh, the cast were good. I mean, I, it's been years. I have one or two copies of the films because I, I love them. But I haven't seen it, oh my gosh, in probably 15 years. That's why I don't remember between This Island Earth. I know in, in, in the one you saw, This Island Earth, is where they had the big giant foreheads. And they were putting together some device. I, I remember that. Uh, and they would go work on it and whatever. But uh, And then they had those big head creatures that looked like something. In fact, they looked like a modern day. Um, uh, when you said you had seen the movie from um, Mars. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. They Mars. almost looked like those guys. Yeah, yeah they, they look the like that. And the brain. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. The heads look a little bit like the um, uh, War of the Worlds. And um, one thing, <clears throat> you know, excuse me, Joe, see all this excitement is getting me a little rusty here. <laughs> but one of the things I also wanted to bring to you, I, I don't know if you ever saw it, Joe, but I think I, I either was in Boys Life magazine. And I know this is a fact. 
they were actually raffling just like the Ralston rocket that went around the country, which I believe, according to what I did a little study on it, in 1985, they scrapped it, correct? Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll get into the, uh, we'll start with the, the history of the rocket. We'll start from the, well, the beginning and, and be, be, head on we, down. Okay, before we get into the history, what I wanted to bring up to your attention is there was a, either a Gemini space capsule, a Powell space capsule, a life-size space capsule that was actually uh, raffled off. Um, I don't know who won it. I remember reading about it many years ago. I do have information, which I'll probably look up and for the future show that, you know, if we do, I can bring it up and, and maybe display some of that information. But um, other than that, let's go over the history, Joe. I know you wrote an entire article on Scary Monsters, like you said, and uh, I'm interested. Tell our, our viewers, I mean, or our listeners about this beautiful yeah, so so space history. so space patrol was was huge. So they in so Ralston, who sponsored uh, the program in 1952, they went to capitalize on on how huge that this was, and they were looking to make it even bigger. So in 1952, at the ABC Television uh, Center, they unveiled their traveling Ralston rock. They called it the the Ralston rocket, and um. They had all the actors there in in their outfits: Buzz Corey, Happy Osborne, Carol Carlisi, Car Carl Eisel. I, I'll never be able to say that right. Uh, Tonger and Major uh, Robertson. Uh, they all took the stage, all in their uniforms, and all you know they were their characters at the time. And um, there was a huge, I mean, there was, you could find photos online. There was a huge crowd of, of kids and parents there uh, all to see this unveiling. So Major Robertson um, took the stage and he handed Buzz a proclamation scroll from the Secretary General of the United Planets. And I was able to find a, when I was doing research for the, uh, the article, I was able to uh, get a hold of a guy on YouTube who actually had the, um, who actually had the the broadcast and it was broadcast right after the the Betty White show they were they were dur- during the Betty White show they had actually cut from it uh, the announcer and they went live to the ABC television center for this major unveiling that's how big this was i mean you know the Betty White show was huge and for them to break away to go to this uh, event was just enormous so anyways Major Robertson, he, he hands Buzz a proclamation and from the Secretary General of the United Planets, and Buzz stands up there and he reads it to the uh, to the audience, and it reads uh, as such: Planet Terra, the Golden City of Terra, capital of the universe, office of the Secretary General. It is hereby acknowledged that the children, the young boys and girls of today, will be the engineers and scientists of the future. In the interest of science and in the honor of the wonderful imaginations of the young in heart, the Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrollers is hereby authorized to award to the children of the Mother Planet Earth for their own special enjoyment, the Ralston Rocket Terra-4, Commander Corey's own Space Patrol Battle Cruiser. Signed, Edward Carl Eisel, Secretary General, United Planets as Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol, as authorized by the Secretary General, I hereby declare that the Space Patrol Battle Cruiser Ralston Rocket Terra-4, the property of the children of Earth, and delegate Lieutenant Tesloff, our recruiting officer, to tour America with it so that all the children may visit it and see it. And That, that, that must was, have been fun, man. That must have yeah. been fun. I mean, that was just very, you know, official. Like, they actually came from, you know, out of this planet to give these kids this rocket. And the kids just, they were going crazy. They loved it. So, as they're, you know, they're, the camera's panning over the uh, the audience and all that. And they they show the, the actual rocket. And the camera uh, announcer, he gives a little bit of back history on what it took to build the rocket. So just some of the characteristics of the rocket were that it was, it was 35 feet in length, 12 feet in height and eight feet wide. Um, 
It was built of 20 gauge steel sheet and contains over 5,000 rivets and screws and over 25 gallons of paint were uh, used. And inside the, uh, the Terra 4 Ralston rocket, uh, it was equipped with two pilot seats, an instrument panel, flashing lights, levers control and rocket blast, a spaceophone, a communication system, food locker, a navigation compartment, and an astrogation instrument, among tons of other stuff. So this thing was legit you know, a legit rocket, you know, for these kids to visit. So what they would do is they would travel around the United States for these events and the kids would line up and they were, they had a few minutes to, to go inside, um, which was usually <laughs> surprisingly only, you know, for all that it was only about 10 seconds. They gave each kid to visit this rocket. So could you imagine standing in line for hours and you get 10 seconds you know, inside the rocket and then they're shuffling you off, you know, but on these events, they usually averaged anywhere from a a thousand to 2000 kids. So that's, that's quite a lot. So they were definitely shuffling them in and out as, as quick as possible. The, the only thing I can think of when you say that, honestly, it comes to my mind is Captain Video with Norton in the Honeymooners. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's the only thing. And you know, the other thing that comes to mind is, um, there was another episode of The Honeymooners called The Man from Space. Remember when uh, Ralph tried to dress up as a man from space? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then they, they told me he was imitating a washing machine. <laughs> yeah, so this, this huge rocket toured around, and it cost $34,000 to, to build. So that was quite an expense at, at that time. That was what it, it cost in 1952 when they built it, correct? Yeah, $34,000. Now, now, Joe... The rocket itself, when they toured, you said they made two copies of it. Yeah. So what they what they did is now there's there's varying there's varying stories out there, and when I was conducting my research, I, I contacted Ralston to try to get some clarification on stuff, and um, they emailed me back and said because the company changed hands and split up into different segments so many times over. Uh, the years that they have no information on the, the Ralston rocket. So I, I had to do my own little digging and what I, I, I found some several, I found several different stories. So there's one of the stories is that they actually had two rockets that, that toured the United States that were exactly the same. And I, I'm guessing if they had two, they probably kept one on the, you know, they broke, they divide the United States into the East and West coast. So they probably had one on, on East coast. And then, um, in now this is where the contest comes in because the rocket was such a hit that in 1953, this would have been late August, 1953, they began to tease about a contest, a space patrol contest. And it was, uh, it first appeared in the episode, The Mystery of Planet X, where they teased it. And the teaser was the mysterious appearance of a new planet estimated to be 5,000 times the size of Earth plunges Buzz Corey and his crew into one of the most startling adventures in the history of space patrol. Captured by the Earth's sun, the gigantic planet, planet moves ominously into orbit on the outer edge of the solar system. So that was their their teaser for this mystery of, of, of planet X. So they didn't come out with the contest yet, but they were, you know, they were getting the kids, you know, getting them a little hyped up and excited for this. So on September 12th, they released a little bit more information on the episode, the primitive men of planet X and the radio episode escape from planet X. So you kind of had to, you know, check out both there to get the, the full story of, of what was going on. Um, so both programs, the television and the radio, they advertise for, quote, mysterious coins that could be found in Ralston cereal packages. So now on the September 19th episode, The Hate Machine of Planet X, it contained the first announcement of the Name the Planet contest to where a lucky kid could win a rocket clubhouse. 
And that's pretty much kind of all they said, you know, a rocket clubhouse. Now that could, you know, that could mean, uh, you know, many different things. You know, was it a cardboard rocket clubhouse, a wooden one? So there really wasn't, you know, too much to go on at, at that time. So then on September 26, Hot Ralston Serials, they released another commercial on the radio episode Target Jupiter, uh, which advertised uh, swell space coins could be found inside the cereal boxes. So they were hitting kids left and right, you know, with the uh, the television show and the radio show. They were really building up the anticipation for this, uh, you for know, this the planet contest. Yeah. Do you know what? Let me ask you a question. You know that when you said the man from Planet X, you know, there was a movie in 1951 uh, that was, I think, directed or pro- it was produced by Jack uh, Polar Fex, I think, of I, I, um, Paul X fan, I think Paul X fan and Audrey Weisberg. And it was in 1951. It was called the man from planet X. Did you yeah. Know? He was a, a little kind of almost Asian looking Martian guy with a big bubble helmet. Yeah. Exactly. That was a good exactly. movie. Yeah. I wonder if it had anything to do with the space. I mean, space patrol copied some of that, I think. Yeah. Uh, they, they might have, well, planet X has always been, always been pretty big. So well, I, you know, I, I think at that time they were really just, kind of playing off the how big their product was and how much they were selling and they were looking for a way to to buy and sell more because now you had to buy the Ralston products in order to find the coins exactly exactly so that that way yeah. they produced the now go ahead so, he, so what they were what they were leading up to the uh to the raffle and of course yeah. so so on the official name the planet contest form uh, you had to buy the official, you, or you had to you had to get the official form, which included slots for the coins. And on the form, it read, "To enter, collect six interplanetary coins and insert on page headed insert contest coins here." You receive three Starlight Silver coins with this album. You get the other three from Instant Ralston and regular Ralston packages. The ones with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on front. Then fill out the official entry blank below with the single word you wish to enter as the name for the new planet. Take this album with coins to your weather bird shoe man. He will check and validate it. Then detach and mail in the official entry blank. You keep your album and coins so you can finish your collection. Be sure to read the official contest rules. All entries must be postmarked by midnight December 1 1953 and received no later than midnight december 7 1953 and then they had they on the same sheet they had what the prizes were so in total there were 1751 prizes to be given out the first prize which i mean this is this still like shocks me on how (laughs) on, on what was given out here so the first prize was a 35 foot rocket ship clubhouse with real white truck tractor to pull it plus fifteen hundred dollars in cash a a schwinn bicycle and other space patrol equipment the second prize group giveaway was 750 schwinn varsity bicycles and a third prize group offered 1000 pieces of space patrol equipment so a lot of lucky boys and girls got some some stuff out, out there but there was one kid who was going to win the uh, the actual rocket, and this was no cardboard box or no. <laughs> That's you know, amazing. Not, nothing, it's amazing, you know, especially for the 1950s. I mean, that's a lot of money and products to be given away, uh, especially yeah. from. Uh, I mean, but that's because you're thinking the 1950s television is big, but I mean, how many people actually could afford a television? Right. Yeah. You know. That's interesting that you brought that up. Uh, that's something I never really talked or. Yeah, you, you would figure most. It. Yeah, most people were probably still listening to the radio at that time. So I'm, I'm guessing that's why. That's why Space Patrol and Ralston, they probably hit it on two fronts with the TV and the radio, because they knew that there was going to be people out there that didn't have the TV. So they wanted to hit that other group that only had the radio. Joe. I could tell you this much in 1970 when I came in 1968 when I came from Cuba not everybody had a television everybody right. that had one I at least 
six out of ten people had a black and white unit. So, I mean, imagine 1953. So, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of almost uh, – well, read this here. Well, this is where – this is where the uh, – now the prize is about to get awarded here now. Go ahead, go ahead. So, I'm listening. I'm excited. Go ahead. I mean, th- this is exciting. <laughs> I mean, I, I can only imagine being this this kid and getting – and receiving this prize. I mean, I, it just absolutely blows my mind. So on a Tuesday afternoon, January 12th, 1954, at 3.15 p.m. in Washington, Illinois, resident Ricky Walker – was presented with the grand prize. Uh, he he w- had been informed January 1st that he won, but he was sworn to secrecy until uh, January 10th. So, and they had the, uh, the, cer- the actual ceremony on the 12th. So, the t- he was a 10-year-old boy, and he had submitted, along with all his coins, the name Caesarea. It was spelled C-E-S-A-R-I-A, Caesarea. So that's what he named this this mysterious planet that had come into uh, Earth's orbit. So he he had won the the grand prize. So during a huge ceremony that was held in the Washington Public Square, thousands of people attended, with many of the kids sporting Space Patrol helmets and other uh, regalia. And if you find any photos of that um, of that ceremony, you could see all these kids. I mean, there's just hundreds of kids in space patrol stuff. They have the, the helmets on the costumes. They're holding blasters. I mean, it's, it looked like a really fun time. So, um, school during that day, you know, cause it was, it was a school day, you know, it's January, Tuesday, it's an afternoon, you know, school was even let out early that day so that Ricky's fifth grade classmates could be there. So this was a, uh, a pretty big deal. And even, uh, there was a reporter for life magazine there, uh, his name was Yale Joel, and he was the one who gathered all the uh, the photos. So if you find any any uh, photos online, they're probably from this uh, this Yale Joel of Life magazine. And um, they had the public ceremony, and uh, the rocket was there, and people got to see it. So after the ceremony, the rocket clubhouse was delivered right to Ricky's driveway where there was just tons of journalists and neighbors uh, just watching this take place. And it pulled up in this, you know, this, this huge kind of like, you know, semi with the trailer it was on. I mean, this thing's, you know, absolutely huge. So there was a reporter there who uh, talked to Ricky, he said, I'm real happy, but awful tired of having my picture taken, which, you know, you could probably imagine from 10 year old boy, he just wants to, you know, go play in his clubhouse. So they asked, um, they asked his old man, Mr. Johnson, uh, what, what they're going to do. And he said, ah, we'll keep it in the backyard for a while, at least until the kids get tired of playing with it. And he said, I, then, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I think they were all kind of, um, they were all kind of uh, surprised that maybe at how, how big it was. So, you know, I, I I'm not sure. You know, there, there's not really much out there of, of kind of what well, they, they said. Um, so the traveling and the prize rockets, uh, there were some differences in them. Um, the traveling rocket had windows along the side, whereas the prize rocket uh, did not, say, for the cockpit window. So that was the only window on that. And the traveling rocket was also more set up inside to look and feel like a rocket ready for space travel, whereas the prize rocket was set up inside to have more of a clubhouse feel. So you probably got more of a authentic feel from the, the traveling rocket, you know, when you get your 10 seconds of, you know, going through it. So, <laughs> you know, Joe, um, I'm going to tell you something I might have. There was a legendary man on, t- on radio that was Paul Harvey, and he always had one thing to say. And now the rest of the story. Yeah. So well, this, is, this is where it gets kind of. Well, here is what I got to tell you, Joe. When I was looking at the rocket, I wanted to kind of tell you this as a su- kind of a surprise ending here. <laughs> 
But I believe I was watching one day an episode of Unusual Houses on either YouTube or it might have been the Travel Channel. And they showed the Ralston rocket. That was one of the homes. I'm trying to think, because it was maybe a year or two ago, and I only recognized it when you forwarded me the photos Mm -hmm. uh, from the article that you wrote. Or I guess, I don't know if it was the article you sent me the photos from, or you you did email me some photos. Now, I'm going to tell you something, though. When you think about it, do you know how cool it would be today to be able to find something like that? And here's the best part. Because of the size, I know what you're saying. They might have scrapped it. You're talking about a whole tractor trailer, basically, loaded with the rocket. Um I really think that you will find or because according to what I read, if I'm correct, was it 1985 when they scrapped it? Yeah. So we'll in 1985, people. Yeah. 1985 was when it was. Yeah. No. yeah people so... would have saved it. I don't think that they would have scrapped it. There was no need for metal. I don't think anybody having something like that would have thrown it out. I guarantee you it's in somebody's backyard. And Joe, be honest. Do you have it hidden in your backyard? Or did you give it to Todd and you guys are holding back? <laughs> I, w- I wish, but but here's the rest of the here's the rest of the story, and it gets kind of sad. And I'll put my my own little input here on why I, I do think that the the rocket is is lost and scrapped. Okay. So so eventually the excitement, you know, just like anything, wore off for for Ricky and his family. Um, there there's several reports out there that state that the just a just a few months you know after that the family sold it the the entire thing now remember it came with the actual the actual truck trailer and rocket so you got the whole shebang you know for it so there's reports that they sold it to a traveling carnival for for a thousand dollars um I, I, please, Joe, don't re, don't say that. Please don't say that. Joe. There's nothing out there to to really confirm that, but you got to remember. I mean, if you see pictures of their house and their neighborhood, it's it's very small and tight. Something this big would would kind of wear out a, its its welcome. I mean, yeah, it, it's amazing, but you got to remember at that time. They're not collecting this stuff, you know. It, it's the excitement of it, and it's going to to wear off. Not like it would be for us today. So, I, I, I'm sure that the family, the the kids, they got kind of tired of it as kids that age will will do. And I'm sure the mom and dad wanted to get rid of it because, like I said, that they they had a tight neighborhood, and it was a their yards and houses were small. So this would have been just a, a huge thing there that would have been taking up space and, and would have eventually become an issue so by by 1980 the rocket was reported to be in the in the hands of harry and eleanor nolan of quincy illinois where it was refurbished as a mobile nasa museum now this actually there are this is substantiated there are photos of the ralston rocket um as this nasa museum uh you could find them online if you you got a little kind of dig for them a little bit um, maybe I'll, I'll throw some photos up on the the website this week on the uh, the blog, so that way people could kind of reference it if they're listening to this podcast. But yeah, you could you could see it on there. It's in kind of uh, rough condition. So by during during well during the early eighties, uh, Starlog magazine launched a nationwide search for the rocket because there were some people that you know. They want to know where this thing was, you know, collecting started to become big, you know, people were, were getting reintroduced to the space patrol. They wanted the nostalgia of it and, and so on. So there was uh, in 1985, there was two collectors located the rocket at a construction site in Jet, New York. It was neglected, severely rusted and just just basically a hunk of metal. It wasn't what it, it well, wasn't a Ralston just- rocket. So what were you saying? This was 1985. Okay. So these two gentlemen they tried to they tried to raise funds to to purchase and relocate and refurbish the rocket. Now remember there was no 
internet there, so you couldn't do, you know, any type of fundraising or anything. So unfortunately, they were unsuccessful in purchasing um, the rocket. I, and and how, how much was the asking price? Do you have any? Uh... No, there's no information on on that. Um, it, there was also a rumor that a New York movie producer owned the rocket at the time and had plans to fix it up for a sci-fi movie. Um, but nothing I could find, you know, about that, that would substantiate those claims. So that's just a, uh, that's just a rumor. A take rumor, it, right. it was. So the rocket was still sitting on the lot several months later at the, uh, the construction company they they now this is in the news straight from the construction company so they deemed the rocket a safety hazard and they sold it off for scrap at a salvage yard a and safety hazard in which way that that i don't know that's crazy i mean they didn't get into why it was a, a safety hazard but so now you have this the raw the the prize ralston rocket was was uh, was sent to a salvage yard and scrapped off that we that we do know that you know that actually happened but what we don't know is what happened to the traveling rocket or rockets because now you still had one possibly two i i believe there was two like i said one for the east coast and one for the west coast it would have made more sense and it would have actually saved probably saved them money in the long run um but I I think that that traveling rocket was ultimately it was either scrapped or refurbished into something else because now you got to remember that Ralston is going to have once they're done with it they're going to have it on their lot or in their um, in their warehouse or whatnot just sitting there and if these companies aren't using it they're going to get rid of it. Let, let me tell you something, Joe, and, and I know this to be true, because when you mentioned the price of $1,000 for the rocket, um, you kind of bought something that did happen for real in my life about maybe, I don't know, give or take a few years, probably about 10 years ago, I was driving in a part of uh, northern Jersey, and there was a firehouse that was having a flea market. So when I saw it, I pulled in. They had an entire fire engine. This thing was maybe 24 feet long. It wasn't like the really big fire engines, mm -hmm. but it had a for sale sign. So I go to the guy, uh, how much is the, you know, just out of curiosity, what blew me away is what he said next. He goes, okay, the brakes are new. I just had them put in. I'm the guy that repairs them. The, the engine is a 1973 fire engine. Ready for this, Joe? $1,500. Oh wow! I was like, "How much?" I said, "Did you say a thousand five hundred? And my wife says, "You're not. Don't even think about it." At that time, I had my house where I had um, oh gosh, I had a pretty long driveway, about 138 feet, and I was like, "You know what, man? I I feel like getting this thing," because when you would go inside, they had it was it was actually it was a fire engine, but it was also used like a medic unit, I think. And uh, the, there was like a big area inside where, where people would work like an office. And what blew my mind is the price. It was running. Everything was fine. And the thing that held me back from getting it was my wife, you know? So yeah, a lot I, of places just want to get, get, get rid of, of it. Stuff, I, yeah. I can see. I can see you coming across a rocket like that. A family doesn't care. 1950s. They've had it for months, whatever. Uh, give me a thousand dollars. But I, I got to tell you, I got to do my research. And, and when this show is over tonight, I'm actually going to do that because I can almost positively, the more I look at the photo, unusual houses or strange houses, I forgot the name of the episode, but I saw that rocket as a home for somebody. It could be one of the traveling ones that you're talking about. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm. I mean, it very well, they very well could be out there, but I, I kind of think that, that the company just, I, I think they destroyed them or they, they use them for parts for other stuff. I, I, I don't believe there's one that's still out there. I mean, I, I would definitely love to see, you know, one of them still be around, but um, 
I, I sincerely doubt it. Now, a, now a buddy of mine, uh, he's about it. He's in his his late seventies, early eighties. He believes he's seen the rocket uh, next to a a small convenience store in Northeast Ohio, up towards like the Lake Erie area, uh, somewhere during the seventies. And he, but he can't remember what the store was or or anything like that. So um, I did some digging online too, and there's you know, people are kind of that are interested in the Ralston rocket and space patrol. They're, they're kind of in the same boat that they, you know, there, there's no leads on it. And like I said, when I contacted Ralston, they don't have any. Okay. That question, what is Ralston? What type of company is it today? You know what? I'm not, I can't really remember. I'll look it up here. Uh, I'm surprised. I think they still do like, I think they still do cereal maybe. I, I, you know what? I don't remember. I don't remember what they they really do. Let me see here. They might. I mean, might... I, I, that's the same thing. I need to do. Yeah, I think they the still do like, uh, yeah, like wheat cereals and uh, okay. stuff like that. Right, breakfast right. stuff. I got you. No, because I was gonna say we still also. I want to do uh, some re, uh, research on that space capsule because I believe somebody had wanted as well. And they, but this capsule, I think what happened was is that they put it in a museum. So they're in with, they're in with Purina company now too. So I'm guessing they probably do dog food and all that. Okay. That, so, that, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, the lady said that they had switched hands and they split up so many times. And, you know, if that happens, they also have to split up and, and separate the stuff that would be in the warehouse. So if that's, if they have this rocket that's sitting in a warehouse that's not doing them any good, they're they're going to get rid of it. You know, they're not even. Yeah, but remember, especially if this is the, in the the eighties or something, they're you know, and if it's in bad condition, they might just think to to scrap it rather than sell it. That's true, Joe. But you also got to remember one thing, okay? The Electro the robot, the nineteen thirty nine World's Fair robot with his dog Sparkle, disappeared between 1950 or 1950 something and until about four years ago when the owner found it in his father's not the owner the the, the son of the guy who did the original uh rover back in 1939 mm-hmm. his son found it inside a pickup truck so they yeah that's crazy <laughs> I, i've read i've read over seven or eight books on the subject and they all said in the book that the robot was scrapped for metal. Yeah. During World War II because of the you know the the need for steel. Um, so you I, I guarantee I can't see something that large being scrapped. I hope but, not. I mean, I I would man, that would be great if it's still around. Well, if it's around, I'll buy it for you, Joe. How's yeah. that? <laughs> you could drive it on over, and we'll we'll park it next to my house and just live in there. We'll do podcasts from out from inside it. <laughs> now, now that you said drive it, did it attach as a trailer to your car, or did it was a self uh, drivable? How, how did it? Uh, it was did... it was on a um, on a trailer. Yeah. Now the. If I remember correctly, I'd have to go back and look at the photos, but the the prize one was on a trailer which was attached to a um it looked like a um kind of like a real small like semi front without the the bedding area. So it was just the the semi. That that whole package was given to the um um to the prize. And I believe the other rocket was trailered as well, the traveling one. I would guess that it would probably have to be to be street legal. It would have to be on a uh, a trailer. I'd have to go back and you know what I, I have. I to... listen, Joe. You don't have to even do that far. I'm actually looking at some photos right now, and one of them there's a truck pulling one, and then there's a black and white photo of the other, and um, it says here the rocket was broken up and scrapped in 1985, several months after the photos above were taken, and this was October 2013. So, I mean, that's when they wrote the article. Yeah. Uh, but the photos that I see here, they you could definitely see it fits in the bed of a, like a pickup truck of some sort, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, hopefully there's, hopefully there's one that's, that's still around. And like I said, I, I'm not sure. I, I haven't 
I've been able to find if there was one or two traveling ones. You you know who would really benefit from if you find that, Joe? Me. No, <laughs> no. Dr. Boyajin, he doesn't have to remember how he said when he was little, he would take his cell phone or something or his father's phone. And he would go over to the corner and pretend he was a space patrol or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't have to do it, man. We can lend him the rocket. He'll be up in heaven. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, though. I mean, the more that we find about nostalgia like this, I'm, I'm very surprised, though, that shows like American Pickers and Pawn Stars and stuff like that haven't had anything concerning those episodes. Or, I mean, concerning uh, something like the Ralston rocket. You know, that that would be something that would be interesting to see or um, it's it something to be on like a uh, unsolved mysteries. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because the only difference is that those people have enough money to do a lot of research on it and they'll be able to contact the people that actually were probably involved in even making the rocket. Yeah. Um, that's something that I mean, I'm sure it's not that hard to do a little research into it. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, even if. Even if the rocket is still around, it's probably, you know, in somebody's backyard, tarped in somebody's backyard. And it, it would, I mean, you would probably have to spend thousands of dollars to, to repair it if it's even repairable. I mean, you see some of these, you know, beautiful cars that are in, you know, people's backyards with a tarp over them and they got a tree growing through them and everything's just, you know, tore up from the weather. And you're like, man, this, this could have been an awesome car if you would have kept it in the garage. But, you know, I almost hope that I almost hope, and I hate to say it, but I almost hope that the rocket was scrapped rather than wasting away in some, some field, you know, with a tarp over it, you know, getting beat up by the weather and animals all over it and stuff. But yeah, that would, but, I, but I'll tell you what, if you were to find it, you can always tell the guy, Hey, listen, it was sold for a thousand. I give you 1500, take it or leave it. I'll just say, I'll take it off your hands. It's not, it's not worth anything. <laughs> I, you know, the more I look at it and stuff, I, I'm like, wow, man, that would be so fantastic. If you have, you know, a nice little backyard in your house, you put the sucker there, you know, run some electrical wires into it so that everything can run off electricity. What a wonderful office that would be. For, oh, yeah. To run a business or whatever. Because you said it was 12 feet high, so that means it's got a pretty decent height. Eight feet wide, and what is it, 35 feet long? Yeah, 35 feet long, 12 wow, feet that, high, eight feet that, wide. That, that's pretty big, man. That's bigger than a, yeah. than a straight job truck. That is really long. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's huge. Yeah, it is. It, it actually is bigger than – I just I, didn't realize it when you said it. You know, I'd almost rather see what the inside of the uh, – because, I mean, you could – there's some pictures of the inside of, of both the traveling and the prize rocket because, you know, we discussed the differences. But I would rather see in person the inside of the traveling one because it was more detailed as an actual space now, rather than a clubhouse. When you said that before, didn't you say there was kind of mystery if they had made what, what? What was the mystery that they had made one or two of them? Of yeah, the there, there's, there's, there's a lot. There's some reports that say one, some that say two, but there's nothing too tangible that says which is either, right? Yeah, nothing to substantiate one or the other. Right, right. I like I said, I I kind of believe there was two, one for the east and one for the west coast. But I mean. It, it you know, would make knows? sense. It, no, it would make sense because I mean, just traveling from one part of the country to the other, with that, it would be. I think definitely they probably had two. Yeah, I mean, and Ralston was such a a huge company. You know, it was Rawl Corp at the time. They were such a huge company and making s m tens of millions off of Space Patrol. It would have been it would have been nothing to build another, you know, rocket and and spend, you know, the the thirty four thousand on it. You know. Well, I, I told you the story, and, and, and this is, I mean, I know you're going to say again. No, it's not again, Joe. But um, one time when my daughter, my oldest daughter, was young, uh, there was uh, this TV show called Shiny Time Station, which probably you remember. And uh, they made one called The Schemer's Robot. Now, that robot, I can swear, is a takeoff from um, the robot from uh, who was, I think, kidnapped in Christmas. What did they call that? That we spoke about one time in one of the episodes. Oh yeah, Marvin, um, the Martians uh, 
kidnap Santa Claus, I think it was, or something like that. And they have a, a robot there that looks just like the one from Schemer's Robot. And one of the things that, Joe, honestly, I contacted the company years ago. I tried to see, you know, if they what what they were going to do with the suit. And they basically, they got me in contact with the guy who, who had created the suit. He wanted 1500 to reproduce the suit for me. And I was thinking about it the other day. As I, I actually was watching the episode again. And I'm saying to myself, I wonder what they ever did with that. Because if I'm, if I'm correct, I don't think Tiny Chimes uh, Station is still, you know, in business today. Um, I just wonder how, I mean, that's where you probably get things that, that, that just get scrapped. Yeah. I, I mean, and and it's so sad, sure. you know, it's very sad. That's what I'm sure happens to a, you know, a lot of these promotional things. And I, I know, like, even years ago, you were able, you know, stores like Walmart, Target, Kmart, all that, you were able to get, like, the uh, the promotional stands. Like, if they had a comic book or a monster character or, or uh, from a movie, you used to be able to, when they were done, if you were lucky enough to be there when they were done with it or it was empty – you could ask a manager and they would usually let you take it. Well, that's not the case anymore. They have to throw the stuff away. Well, they do that because they know people are going to try to sell it for, you know, large amounts right. of money. And even like this, I know like the star Wars stuff, they actually have to, um, they actually have to return that stuff. So that way nobody could go, you know, dumpster diving for it. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, years ago you used to be able to go to stores and grab all that stuff. And even, you know, I had a buddy that worked in a movie theater, you know, about 20 years ago or so you, you were able to, once the movie was done there, you would, they would give away the posters to the employees and they could do what they want with them. You know, that's not the case anymore. Now I, you know, they, I believe have to return them, but like you you said, so that people don't sell it. Yeah. But do you know, I mean, I I have this story in an old magazine that is probably from the nineties. I haven't read it in a while. So this is just, you know, guesswork what I'm saying, but I know that they said, that the original Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet was purchased. They had it in, in some pizzeria where they just had it standing up in there. And the guy, some guy, I forgot the guy the guy's name. I think they go, they have a nickname for him, the Robot Man or something. He purchased the Robbie. He, re, you know, repaired it. And then he started making uh, duplicates. And in fact, the life-size Robbie the Robots and B9 Robots they sell out there today are made by him. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, he does charge, I think it's 25 th- In fact, the Sharper Image was selling Robbie, too, at one time. Uh, they can go anywhere from 25000 to $35,000. None of them walk. They're all solid. At the top moves. It talks. You know, it has the same uh, soundtrack as the original movie. Yeah. Um, I stood next in Chiller Theater. They had two, I think, two or four life-size B9 robots. Oh, wow. Space. And they're seven feet tall, those things. Let me tell you, man. I got some photos. I'm going to try to see if I find them so I can post them. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. I always wanted this, man. <laughs> well, hey, we got about two minutes left here. So give us your, your final thoughts for the for this uh, this podcast. Well, Joe, my final thoughts are that, again, we're, you know, which, of course, you and myself and Chuck and, the whole crew and Todd and stuff are coming up with new ideas, new ways to expand our show, to, you know, uh, make our website even better. And it's happening soon. I mean, including that thing with the NFTs, if we do sign the contract with the company, uh, which I'm, I'm reviewing some of the paperwork on that, you know, there's a lot of good things coming up ahead. And, and House of the Unusual will continue to grow and bring back to you, people out there, to listeners, all the classics from the 70s, everything that we always wanted from comic book uh, stuff to Boy's Life magazine stuff, whatever we wanted to order, we're going to get a chance again to get most of those products again, uh, even though right now you can't. But anyway, go ahead, Joe. All right. So I'd just like to thank everybody out there for tuning into us once again and supporting us. Head over to your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe to our channel. Give us a uh, a good review if you so wish. Also, head over to houseoftheunusual.com. Uh, we have a 
cool site over there, a, uh, a free forum that you could sign up on and talk with some like-minded individuals. There's always some good conversations going on there. Some man, people are posting some awesome photos of their, their collectibles and everything. So there's always something new and exciting there. And uh, I'm always learning something on, on that site when people are posting their stuff. So head on over to there. Also check us out on YouTube, type in house of the unusual in the search, find our, our page, subscribe to it, check out our videos and give them a like and a uh, comment on them. So thank you again for everybody that is listening to us and continues to tune into us. So good night, Eddie. Good night, Joe. Till next week.